The Nikon Z9 is a fantastic camera, but its size and price have proven to be serious barriers for many shooters. So now Nikon has this, the Z8, which is basically a Z9 with the latest firmware, but at 30% smaller and nearly 30% cheaper too. What's not to like? Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and every second that you aren't running, I'm getting closer. As usual, for disclosure, Nikon lent me this camera to make this review. I don't get to keep it, no money changed hands, and Nikon does not get any input on this video's production or get to preview it before it's posted. This video does have an actual sponsor though, and that's iFootage. Now, I don't like to make videos that I've already made, and since this is fundamentally a Z9, I'd like to think I already made two videos on this camera. So if you want to know about the regular stuff that's mostly unchanged, I suggest you watch my initial review, and I also have a video about the 2.0 firmware and the Nikon RAW. So instead today we're going to be focusing on what's been improved and talking a bit about the 3.0 firmware that I never covered because this camera comes with those latest features at launch. So let's start with what's different about the body. It's smaller, which means a smaller battery and less heat dissipation than the Z9, which we'll get into in a second. Ergonomically though, it's a big win for me. It's not nearly as heavy as the Z9 and feels more like a DSLR body. It's still large for mirrorless, but very comfortable if you're used to something like a D850. And it's very spacious and forgiving if you've got big hands. The LCD screen is great. It doesn't flip out, but it's 2.1 million dots and gives plenty of mobility for tilting in both orientations. The button layout is mostly the same, for better or worse, and the experience is extremely familiar. The body isn't as weather sealed as the Z9, but it's still highly resistant to inclement weather. It still features 3.5 mm headphone and mic jacks, a full-size HDMI port, and a USB-C port for power delivery. But now they have a second USB-C port just for communication, which is nice because lately I've been rigging out cameras and running into issues where I can't use the USB-C port for power if I want to use it for anything else. This isn't a problem here, which is cool. The card slots are different than the Z9. You now have one CF Express slot, which is backwards compatible with XQD, and one SD card slot. Normally, I would complain that this limits our ability to do backup recording with higher bitrate codecs, but Nikon still hasn't implemented redundant recording in video anyway, so the different card types isn't really an issue for video shooters. However, I did complain a lot about the card door on the Z9, and I'm happy to report that this door is much easier to open, although it does take some getting used to because part of the grip opens with the door so you have to reposition your hand. As I mentioned, the battery is the smaller EL15C, the same form factor you'd find in many other Nikon cameras, but it does mean we take a hit on record times. Now, as usual with any overheating tests, it's important to keep ambient temperature in mind. I can offer advice for shooting in a climate controlled environment or outdoors up to about 24 Celsius or 75 Fahrenheit, but beyond that, your mileage may vary and very likely decrease. Also, remember that Nikon now has a temperature threshold setting in the menu, they advised me that when you set it to standard, you can expect about 60 minutes of 8K recording, and when set to high, you'll get closer to 90 minutes. And I found those numbers to be reasonably accurate in my environment. When set to 8K24 with the H265 codec, I recorded for one hour and 35 minutes before the camera overheated. And after letting it cool and recording again, I got another 19 minutes before the battery died. So about one hour and 54 minutes on battery in that mode. In 4K24, which is oversampled from the 8K, I recorded for one hour and 58 minutes without overheating before the battery died. In both modes, I got a hot card warning after about 20 to 30 minutes, and this is because I was using the CF Express slot. You likely wouldn't see that with the SD card recording though. Now, it's interesting to note that you can extend the battery life in 4K24 recording by plugging in USB-C power delivery, but this camera still possesses the two hour and five minute recording limit. Now, I've asked Nikon why this exists multiple times and I've still never gotten an answer. In a way, you could say it works out nicely, that the camera will either overheat or the battery will die before that two hour mark anyway. And at that point, you could just do a card and battery swap every two hours, which will also help cool the camera. But it's just important to remember that if you need to record long uninterrupted clips, you'll need to hook up an external recorder, which should also reduce the overheating too. Speaking of cooling off the camera though, let's talk about the hottest mode, 8K60 RAW. In this mode, I got a yellow temp warning at 11 minutes, a hot card warning at 12, and then a red temp warning at 15 minutes, and then a red warning with the word high at 23 minutes. It's funny how much information Nikon tries to give with the overheating. You end up with a lot of stuff on your screen. And then when it finally overheats, it starts a countdown, which is stressful, but helpful. Anyway, I made it all the way to 24 and a half minutes, but then my card was full. This was using the 650 gigabyte pro grade CF Express card, and I was using the more compressed RAW. If you use the high quality RAW, you get less than 15 minutes with 650 gigabytes at 8K60. Anyway, 
I quickly formatted and started recording again to keep the temperature up on the camera and the card, and I was able to record for just over another 23 minutes before it overheated. So that's about 48 minutes total of 8K60 RAW with a quick format halfway through. If I let it cool for one minute, I can record for another 10 minutes. If I let it cool for five minutes, I could fill the card again with another 24 minutes of recording. Now when recording in 4K60 on this camera, you have the option to enable extended oversampling, which lets you oversample beyond the usual 4K24 and do it up to 4K60 as well. In this mode, you can expect performance similar to 8K60, since that's basically what the camera is reading at. In my test, the oversampled 4K60 overheated at 56 minutes, if, however, I recorded 4K60 in the bin or line skip mode with oversampling turned off, then I didn't experience any overheating. Lastly, let's say you record a more modest 8K24 RAW. Well, first, I only got an hour of card space on that 650 gig card, but I did manage to quickly format it at that one hour mark and record again immediately and do that until the battery died, which for me was one hour and 53 minutes total, which logically is similar to the 4K24 oversampled performance. So what's the verdict? Well, you're limited to two hours recording either way, unless you record externally. And many of the modes can get you almost two hours of battery life without overheating. The modes that do overheat more quickly should still get you close to an hour in a studio environment and at least 50 minutes at 24C or below. But it also cools down quickly. So if you're just recording clips, I don't see this camera being an issue for you. But if you want really long takes, you're gonna to need to buy an external recorder. And at that point, there's probably better options for the money. Now, while we're talking about all these different recording modes, let's talk rolling shutter because I didn't have my strobe when I reviewed the Z9. So now I can give you some actual numbers regarding the read speeds of the sensor. So if you record using the full 8.3K sensor, whether that's for an 8K recording or an oversampled 4K recording, you can expect about 14.5 milliseconds, which is slower than something like an A7S III, but probably the fastest of these full frame 8K hybrid cameras. If you shoot 4K 120 or the line skipped 4K 60, the read speed drastically improves to 4.9 milliseconds, which is extremely fast. I really like how Nikon gives us the option between a slower but higher quality 4K 60 or a fast reading non oversampled 4K 60 from when we need that. I wish more brands would do this. If you switch to the DX crop, which still does some oversampling, but from a lower resolution starting point, the 4K up to 60 frames per second reads at 9.6 milliseconds and 6.6 .6 milliseconds if you shoot 4K 120. This suggests that there'll be some minor quality loss when comparing the 4K 120 to 4K 60 in this mode, as it can only read faster if it isn't processing as much data. But overall, this is a fast sensor. Again, probably the best in its class. You know what else is best in its class? The new panel lights from iFootage, the PL1 ADBN and ADC. The ADBN sets a new standard for bicolor lighting with its innovative BLWW mixing technology, which combines blue, lime, warm white, and cold white LEDs to give more precise performance and exceptional color accuracy, which also more closely mimics the natural light of the sun. They also have an RGB option with the PL1 ADC, which actually manages to double the output intensity of its colors compared to competing lights with similar wattage. Both lights feature a fine-tuned 45 degree beam angle, granting a three-fold increase in illuminance while maintaining power efficiency, which allows for consistent lighting even up to three meters away. And the lights can be controlled using the intuitive precision dials on the fixture itself or with the iFootage Lumen app, which now offers a preset function that gives the ability to elegantly switch between different lighting setups within the same scene. I highly encourage you to discover the power and precision of iFootage's new panel lights by using the link in the description below. Now let's talk about dynamic range. So you've got four different options for recording. There's the H.265 codec that will get you up to 8K30 or 4K 120. There's ProRes 422HQ, which goes up to 4K60. There's ProRes RAW, which is 4.1K up to 60P, but I don't personally mess with ProRes RAW much. I'm not a big fan of it, and I use DaVinci Resolve. And then you got NRAW, which is the only way to get to 8K60, but can also do 4.1K up to 120 frames per second. So let's start with ProRes 422HQ, 4K24, and Nlog to get a baseline sense of performance. Using the Xyla 21 and Imatest, we measured a total of 14 stops of dynamic range, which is reflected here under slope-based DR. But we also like to determine how many clean stops dynamic range we have when factoring in noise, which can be seen here next to medium, which is with a signal noise ratio of two, and there we get 12.1 stops, which is a respectable score for ProRes, which tends to be less forgiving than H.265. If we bump the ISO to 4000 from 800, which is this camera's second native ISO, we can see that we maintain our 14 stops total and 12 stops medium, which is great. However, if we switch to H.265, we get some very bizarre results. The noise reduction is so intense that Imatest is suggesting that all 14 stops are preserved all the way down. And if you look at the graphs, the color channels have all bled together to form a black line instead of separate channels as normal. The same thing happens at both native ISOs and even when shooting 8K and H.265. 
So I had a look at the shadows, brighten them up in post, and then compare them to the ProRes version, and sure enough, we can see significant blocking in artifacts when compared to ProRes, which explains the weird results. However, after further testing, I noticed that the issue mostly resolves itself after a few seconds of recording. Now, there's still far too much noise reduction in my opinion, especially when compared to ProRes, but it's at least usable and measurable now. And when doing that, we see 13.8 stops total, but now with a medium score of 13.3, which is how you know the noise reduction is too aggressive. You shouldn't be able to jump from 12.1 to 13.3 just by switching codecs. The 8K version, when sampled from later in the clip, isn't as offensive. It measures 12.4 on the medium, which is much more logical when you factor in the oversampling that occurs by dropping an 8K clip on a 4K timeline. So my advice is that if you want to shoot H.265 on this camera, shoot an 8K. But if you have to use 4K H.265, make sure you aren't putting anything critical in the first few seconds of the recording. Give it a little buffer time to smooth out those artifacts in the shadows. But ProRes HQ is definitely the better option all around. Now let's talk about NRAW. If you drop 8K RAW on an 8K timeline, our medium score drops to about 10 stops. This should give you an idea of how noisy the RAW is, but to fairly compare it against the ProRes, we need to put it on a 4K timeline to account for the oversampling and the 4K limit of ProRes. When we do that, the score jumps to 11.6, which gives us our baseline before any noise reduction is applied. This is a very manageable starting point, and more detail is definitely preserved in the RAW when comparing it to the ProRes 422HQ. So if you'd like to fine-tune your noise reduction in post, this would probably be the way to go. But again, we have to consider those absurd file sizes. I can get nearly double the record time of ProRes than I can of NRAW in its most compressed state. So I'd still say overall the best codec on this camera for balancing image quality and usability would be the ProRes 422HQ. You can still oversample all the way up to 4K60 from that 8K image, but with less hassle than the alternatives while gaining a streamlined post-production experience. But I should mention that the RAW panel for NRAW and DaVinci Resolve has been improved. While I still wish you could decode to other well-known gammas, the clips are now correctly displaying as 12-bit. The exposure adjustment now works more logically where one point of exposure equals one stop instead of the previous 0.5 system, and the overall performance of NRAW seems smoother to me. However, the white balance adjustments still aren't easy fixes like others I've used. You can't just type in a white balance and move on like you can with other RAW types. There are major color shifts that need to be caressed. This is a disappointment and furthers my case that ProRes 422HQ is the best choice most of the time. Another thing that's improved since the last time I used the Z9 is the Nikon LUT. There's now a version 2 of the LUT that fixes the issue of having major jumps in the tonal range. The new LUT transitions much smoother between stops. And I've noticed that the LUT and the view assist for the Z8 is a close match to that V2 LUT for the Z9. So that's good. One thing to keep in mind though is that the V2 LUT raises your final exposure more than the V1 LUT did. So you might have to retrain how you expose if you shot a lot with the V1 version. But again, the view assist on the Z8 helps a lot with this. The colors of the new LUT are slightly different too. Not a major departure, but slight differences in luma and tweaks to the hues. I'd say the new LUT is slightly more color accurate, but it's not a huge difference once you account for the exposure change. But the gradations are nicer. Now, as I mentioned, there are some other improvements I haven't covered that came with 3.0 firmware for the Z9, which we'll find here in the Z8. First off, there's this new high-res zoom feature for 4K video. Basically, it uses the 8K resolution of the sensor, but instead of oversampling, you can use the extra resolution to zoom up to two times smoothly into the frame. It works well for what it is, and it can definitely be handy for certain situations, but it does have some caveats. First, it only seems to work up to 30 frames per second, and it also seems to disable subject detection when enabled. Autofocus still works, just not as well. What's cool though is that you can set it to be activated by the control ring of your lens so it feels like you're actually zooming. And speaking of lens rings, Nikon has dramatically expanded the lenses that support that new linear manual focus throw and distance customization. Last time I had the Z9, I think it only worked on two lenses, but now every lens I tested works. Some just require firmware updates. This is great and makes manual focusing a much nicer experience. They've also added integration for wireless timecode using air glue and the Atomos UltraSync Blue. And there's also been some improvements to the autofocus for better reliability. They've added more subjects like airplanes and enhanced the tracking. Now, I can't give a comparison here as I don't have the previous version, but I'd say it does feel pretty confident in most situations, but still struggles with low light autofocus on video and is still highly dependent on which lens you're using. I'd give it a 7.5 out of 10 if that's worth anything. And yes, for the photographers watching, it even takes pictures. It actually takes them very quickly, and firmware 3.0 brought some additional high-speed capture modes. And if you're in photo mode and you rotate to vertical orientation, the on-screen information restructures itself to look better for vertical shooting. It doesn't do this in video though, as far as I can tell. And that's pretty much it. Like I said, this camera is fundamentally a firmware upgraded Z9 in a much smaller and cheaper package. And that's saying something, because the Z9 is great. 
So as long as you don't mind the worst battery or thermal management, this is nothing but upsides. And those issues aren't as impactful when you consider the peculiar two hour limit both of those cameras put on your clips anyway. And you can always add a grip to this camera to match the battery life and form factor of the Z9, but for less total cost. And this is a cheaper entry point as well if you plan on adding external recording hardware to get past that two hour limit. So no matter how you slice it, you're gonna be spending less to get the same or better. They've basically made a great camera more accessible, and that's a win in my books. All right, I'm done. <laughs>